Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 117. In this episode, I interview Dr. Allison Justice. She has a PhD in plant environmental science from Clemson University. She is also a consultant, owns the hemp mine, and created the CRC, which is a science-based research group. She has advanced knowledge in post-harvest production, so drying, curing, and that's what today's episode is about. She talks about some of the key information when it comes to harvesting, drying, and curing, and she also talks about some studies that have been done in those areas. If you want to see highlights of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. That channel is dedicated to short, bite-sized clips of these episodes. I actually did a poll on my YouTube channel where this podcast episode is posted to, and 53% of the people that responded weren't aware that I have another YouTube channel. I call it my main YouTube channel where I show off the plants that I grow. That channel has over 130 videos from the past seven years, so if you're not familiar with it, I'll leave a link down in the YouTube description section below so you can easily get to it and subscribe. One of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AEC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Check out their electric sprayers with a 2 liter capacity and an adjustable nozzle that can go from a strong jet to a fine mist spray. Their sprayers are battery powered and can be used for 3 hours on a full charge. No pumping required and it's a one button operation. Click the link in the description section below so you can learn more about their sprayers and the discount code MrGrowit15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Stash Blend. I've been using Stash Blend for over a year now and it's awesome. One of the things that I really like is that it saves me money. It's a whole bunch of different inputs in one. So I no longer have to go out there and buy a silica bottle, then a separate seaweed bottle, beneficial bacteria, then a separate one for mycorrhizal fungi. All of that plus more is in this one blend. Go to stashblend.com to learn more about it. And I also have a link down in the YouTube description section below. Spider Farmer. Check out their 6 liter cool mist humidifier which can be placed inside the grow tent or outside of it. If placed outside of your grow tent, you can use the included flexible hose which splits into two to help distribute the humidity evenly across the grow space. Also check out their clip fan which oscillates and has 7 speed settings to help simulate the natural wind outdoors. It has a 100 degree vertical manual oscillation and a 90 degree horizontal automatic oscillation. Discount code MrGrowIt5 works on both Amazon and the website, spider-farmer.com. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today, I am joined with Dr. Allison Justice. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. We met last year at a conference, uh, had a good conversation. You actually knew you before the conference. I'm very familiar with your work. I went through the Utah State University, the Cultivation Certificate Program, and I know you have a couple talks in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them was on post-harvest production, the harvesting, drying, and curing. And that's really what I want to get into today is you just have so much experience in regards to that. And we've come so far in the past five years alone. It's it's amazing what we've uncovered. So yeah, I'm Mm -hmm. sure that you're going to give us a bunch of insight. And I think uh, a lot of my audience is going to learn some things today that they haven't known because... I feel like a lot of the stuff still isn't widespread as much as it could be. But before we get deep into things, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah. So, you know, I think I was I was born with it. I was born with green thumbs. Um, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, their parents, everybody has been farmers for one thing or the other. So, uh, yeah, I, I was basically born in a greenhouse. Um, we grew trees, uh, bare root, ball and burlap. Um, we did petunias and pansies at one point, a little bit of everything. Um, and so because of that, I swore I was never going to go into plants when I was older. But <laughs> here I am with a PhD in plant science. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those things when you're little, you're not going to do what your parents do. But, you know, I uh, I, I, I loved it. And. I got into it, obviously. Um, but I, I got my PhD from Clemson University in, in plant and environmental science. And, um, you know, I, to be honest, I didn't know exactly wanted, what I wanted to do after graduation. And so 
Uh, I did some consulting for a while with pest management for greenhouses across the U.S. and started getting some calls for medicinal plant consulting. And so I took a few jobs and loved it. Packed my stuff up and uh, I got a job first, but I packed my stuff up and, and moved to San Diego and stayed out there for about three and a half years um, working for a vertical group, uh, which was wonderful. I got to learn everything from seed to sell, as they say it. Um, and then decided I, I wanted to, to do my own thing and, um, you know, have a little more freedom to research what I wanted and do what I wanted um, and not be tied down by, um, you know, hitting a bottom line per se. So uh, even though that is, of course, still important, um, but, you know, research and, and commercial production is certainly a, a different world to live in. So I moved back to South Carolina where um, we've been growing under the hemp program. Um, since I guess 2018 and here we I own the hemp mine so that's a, a CBD company um, you know, we do everything from breeding selling genetics all the way to harvest and um, consumer goods and that sort of thing uh, but really what's near and dear to my heart is the research aspect and um, we created the CRC the Cannabis Research Coalition with uh, Dr. Faust at Clemson University and so we've been running that for about uh, about three years now, and it's it's really a, a three tiered program, I guess you could call it. One is more of a membership model where you give money, um, and what you receive back in return is uh, early access to research all of the nitty gritty that may not be published in a, a peer reviewed paper. Um, SOPs, access to talk to, you know, hear and listen from some of the nation's top growers, you know, glass house, um, state house, et cetera, et cetera. And so just a place to get together and talk about some of the problems you're having um, as far as growing goes. Um, we're also a contract research organization. And so if somebody's having problems or if they have a great product and they say, you know, we've we've had as much internal R&D as possible. Um, let's, we need somebody else to verify it because, you know, how, how, you know, you can trust your own research, but if you're someone trying to buy a product, you don't necessarily only want to listen to internal research. So we're that third party, non-biased, um, you know, nothing tied to, to, to support bias, which I know later you want to talk about that in a little, a little greater detail, which I'm happy to. Um, and then of course we do consulting and audits and, and things of that nature. That's awesome. Yeah, you have so much going on. And uh, yeah, Clemson University, Dr. Yim Spouse, big name there in regards to post-harvest production as well. I know he had a talk at Utah State University. You guys go real, real deep into it and uh, a lot deeper than I think the average home grower goes into it. Being able to expose some of the information here today, I think is going to be really valuable. So let's just get right into it. Let's get into, uh, let's start with harvesting, then we'll get into drying and then curing. So for harvesting, Talking about the ideal time to harvest a plant. Now, it's mostly known that when the trichomes are mostly cloudy, that's when they're at the highest potency. Now, some people like for it to turn amber, where the inside cannabinoids go from THC to CBN. Is all of that still true today? Is that still the ideal time to harvest a plant? You know, you said earlier that... You said earlier that in the last five years we've come a long way, but the deeper in I get, the more I understand how much I don't understand. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll give you what's known today or at least what's theorized today um, because, you know, there's more than what any of us in any of our lifetimes are going to figure out. You know, this is certainly going to be something that's done for hundreds of years um, and, and what is why this industry is so exciting for me because if I were to study petunias or poinsettias, you know, there's hundreds of of, of uh, journals out there with great information already. So, but yeah, with, with harvesting, I would say the most important thing is to be delicate with the plants. Um, you know, if you're in a commercial setting, a lot of times you're rushed in a hurry and you're just throwing plants around. You know, every time you touch a trichome, it will bust. Um, for lack of better words. So just being as delicate as possible, having it touch as little things as possible um, will certainly keep your plant in a lot better state. But as far as when, you know, what color uh, the trichome is, 
you know, I have found by, you know, by being a breeder and seeing lots of different varieties, CBD, CBG, THC, you know, seeing all of the varieties that are out there that produce different cannabinoids, I, I've yet to find a, a true consistency of, you know, being able to say 10% amber, perfect harvest. Um, it, it doesn't happen the same way with every variety. So, you know, what, what I always suggest is if you have a new variety, and a lot of this is costly, but this is this is perfect world scenario, okay? You have a new variety, and the breeder says it's an eight-week plant. At, at week, I mean, the earlier you go, the better, and you can graph it out and see how, you know, your THC, CBD, whatever it is, um, can progress and, and where it peaks and where it starts to decline, and you can compare that to you know, what it looks like under the microscope, and then you have that to repeat from. Um, but testing's expensive, and, you know, it's not necessarily worth it for everyone. But I would just say repetition and growing a variety. Um, and, and a lot of it's personal preference as well. I mean, I, I like mine to be on the earlier side where they're more, they're more clear. Um, and then there's some people that they want it to be extremely amber. So a lot of that's preference. And um, this is this is simply theory, but I do not think the amber comes from the THC to CBN conversion. I think it could be uh, some sort of non-enzymatic browning, um, like other plants do when they ripen. So bananas and uh, apples, when you cut them, there's some uh, enz enzymatic browning happening. Um, and so that's hope, uh, hopefully something I'll get to dig into this year, um, finding people to work with that can test some of these more nitty gritty aspects of the plant has, has been pretty tough. Um, and we finally got um, a university other than Clemson that will test for carbohydrates and, and um, the pieces that can lead you down that road of starch to sugar conversion. And, you know, r what I truly think is the, the guts to what is equating to a, a good cure. Got it. Yeah. So it comes down to personal preference. Uh, I personally like mostly cloudy with a little bit of amber. I talk to so many people who are just like, oh, 10% amber, 20% amber. But yeah, at the end of the day, it comes down to personal preference, like you had said. You know, if you're looking at your trichomes and you're counting them, it can be tricky sometimes because are you looking at the top ones where, you know, the light is directly hitting them? Or are you looking at a, a inside piece or a lower bud because all that can be different throughout the plant too. That makes sense. Now you mentioned the starch to sugar conversion, which kind of relates to the next question I have here, which is in regards to flushing the plants before harvest. Now there have been some studies that came out in regards to flushing the plants before harvest, whether or not it's beneficial. I've talked to many guests in the past. I like to bring this question up because each person kind of has their own little little tidbits on it, little insight on it. And uh, so I wanted to ask you this. Are there any benefits to flushing your plants before harvesting it? You know, thus far, there's been a, a couple studies out about it. And, you know, I think the only true solid takeaway we can have is that if you stop fertilizing two weeks prior to harvest, there's no differences in what's been tested so far. And so that really is terpenes, cannabinoids, yield, um, with, I believe Mike's work, Mike from Clemson, his work was showing that if you go further than two weeks of fertilizer restriction, then you're going to start losing some yield, which makes sense. Um, but right at that two week mark, you're not losing yield and you're not losing any sort of potency. Um, so what that tells me is stop wasting your fertilizer and, you know, you're not having any negative from doing it. So why do it? Um, but again, theory, and again, again, something that this year we're going to get done is looking at what else is happening during that flushing process. Um, you know, when you flush, you see color change, you see, um, depending on how hard and you know, intense your flush is, um, you'll see faster ripening. Um, and so it's my theory that that is, in fact, what's happening is you're cutting off the nutrients. A lot of times you're lowering the temperature. So the plant is being pushed into maturation faster than it would be if it were still getting all the nitrogen and everything that um, would be encouraging it to stay um, 
grow, I say vegetatively, but I don't mean it being in this vegetative form. I just mean in, in bulk. Um, you're not pushing that nitrogen for excess growth. The plant thinks it's fall. They think, oh no, it's time to you know close up shop and protect these seeds. So we need to ripen. So I would expect, I suspect, that flushing does help to push maturation that then changes those carbohydrates um, from being starches to sugars. I also think there's some play in that as well, um, the starch to sugar conversion in those, I don't know, probably first five days or so of drying um, because it is still active. Um, you know, it's it's difficult to to say when a plant is dead because it depends on how, you know, it all depends on how much water is in it ultimately. You know, is this thing alive or not due to the water in it, due to the water supporting some of the enzymatic activities that can happen. Um, so I would expect, you know, those last few weeks of growing and then those first few weeks of, of dry, first couple of weeks of drying to really be when those changes are happening. Um, and like I said, it, it's been a couple year mission trying to uh, get the right testing available for this plant specifically to be able to check that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Ever since that study came out by Arc Screen Technologies back in 2020, in regards, it really showed no difference between the two. I actually made a video on it and I talked about how, yeah, well, the same viewpoint as you. It's like, well, you can save money on fertilizer. Why feed the plant up until the end if? It's not doing anything differently for you. The responses I got off of that was hilarious. But now it seems like the biggest argument is the starch to sugar conversion. And right now we just don't have the data to back that up. And it's interesting that that's the route that you're trying to go to actively research and see if there is anything there. So looking forward to seeing what comes out of there in the future. Yeah, it should be interesting. Now, what about giving the plants a period of darkness before harvest? That's another thing that folks do in order to try to achieve a better result. Here are a varying number of reasons of why people do it, but 24 hours of darkness before harvest, 48 hours of darkness before harvest, some people do even longer than that. Is there any benefit at all to giving your plants a period of darkness before harvest? Uh, you know, again, it's been one of those things I've, I've kind of sat on the fence about, um, could see the, the benefit of why. And again, I, I would lend it towards being an act to encourage maturation. Um, you know, we're we're digging deeper into trying to understand what the the outer structure of the the trichome gland, um, you know, how it's composed, what it's made out of, and what really encourages it to crack or not. Um, and and a lot of that works with canatrol. Um, but I, you know, I think there's there's something to be found about its it, it strength um, and with proper curing and harvesting, not disturbing it, making it stronger and more encapsulated. Um, you know, it's always been interesting when you go into drying rooms of large facilities, you know, you just smell it a mile down the road. And if it's the day of, of uh, harvest or, you know, day after whatever, um, and you can smell it and, you know, my, my thoughts always, well, if it's in my nose, it's not in the plant. You know, th there's terps in the air, and it's not like they're continuing to make these terpenes. And so, you know, at some point, it's going to be spent. Um, and so if we're able to preserve that trichome head better, you know, does that make your quality last longer? Um, that's something that, that we're digging deep to, and it's hard. I mean, the... <laughs> tiny it's tiny and so you know uh, learning the scanning electron uh, microscopy and and really digging into that this past year and this year has been an eye-opener um and understanding again how much we don't understand and being able to see in detail that close because there are there are some drawbacks from it too as, as cool as the pictures look look it's also not the whole story yeah, that's crazy. There's still a lot, so many people out there that prefer the darkness before harvest and they're kind of blind in the fact on whether or not it is beneficial. So I guess that debate is going to, is going to be ongoing from here. <laughs> I think so. So any overall tips for harvesting or anything we kind of need to know about, about harvesting before we move on to drying and curing? You know, I think, I think for 
harvesting drying it's is delicate you know you you've got to think of even if it's 10 minutes where you've placed it in the sun you know if we if we're talking about for smokable flour um 10 minutes in the sun could do a ton of damage so you know being being fast at making your moves and you know being delicate and consistent with everything okay now let's move on to drying talk to us about the goal of drying really water activity is one of the things that come to mind right away so can you talk to us about you know what water activity is and kind of the overall goal of it and so on and so forth yeah so you know drying is the first thing that comes to mind is like you said water activity for the point of not spoiling so we're getting the water out just like we would any other foods raisins whatever it may be um, getting it down low enough to where um, it does not support proliferation of microbes um, now drying does not kill microbes um, there's lots of spores and bacteria that are super hardy um, and we can dry it down to a crisp and those spores are still going to be there so once it's rehydrated they could take over um, but the point is to get that water activity low enough to to not support other life growing on it um, and that's really the difference between water activity and moisture content you know they're they're very related but the difference there is um, available water for microbes to to uh, persist in so the goal correct me if i'm wrong is 0. 0.6 water activity and that prohibits the growth of moles and yeasts and so on and so forth yes yep that is today's goal Okay. Now, are there any tools that growers can purchase in order to measure water activity? Yeah. Uh, moisture content meters are pretty inexpensive, but they are also very damaging. Um, to get a proper reading, you almost have to take a full bud and, you know, uh, squeeze it as tight as you can and then stick the prongs in. Um, but again, then you're ruining a bud, um, and that's not a great thing. Um the other thing, which is, you know, it's got its drawbacks too, is a water activity meter. Um, and they can be quite pricey. A thousand dollars on up, you know, ten thousand dollars for a really high end one. Um, so those aren't my preference either. Um, at least in the home grower space, you know, the, it, it's overkill. Um, one thing I like to do is you know, put your plants in the drying room. Bring it down to where you think it's just about right. And if you debud your flowers, put it in a jar and then have a humidistat in the jar. Once once you see the humidity level stabilize, that is your uh, water activity. So your humidity then turns into the uh, water activity. I mean, you got to move the decimal two points, but um, ultimately it's the same. So if you have a jar, put a few buds in there and it reads... 70 percent humidity after it's leveled um because there'll be a, a time of fluctuation uh for the moisture to homogenize throughout but once you get to that homogenized state if it reads 70 percent let's say then you're at a 0.7 water activity and you you might want to keep the lid open for a couple of days or that sort of thing got it yeah i think that's what a lot of home growers are doing today so pretty straightforward there um it really from what you're telling me, it's not really worth it to go and spend money on a moisture meter or a water activity meter for the average home grower. Just putting the buds in the jar and, and getting that humidity down, you're safe at that point. So for drying conditions, you know, temperature, humidity, what are the ideal dry conditions? You know, I think the, the traditional 60-60 that everybody's been using for forever, um, it works. It works. Five points either way also works. Um, you know, I think being able to go slower on the days it takes to fully remove a certain amount of water um, could is beneficial for terpene retention uh, because the faster you're bring your, bringing that water out, the faster you potentially could be volatilizing your terpenes off too. So um, I think there's a a nice medium point which sixty sixty it achieves well. Um, you know, I, I think the, the time will come where we start to understand, again, how delicate these trichomes are. You know, one thing that you get when you're using very traditional systems, you know, let's say a, a mini split and a dehue, 
when you're looking at tracking over time, even though your set points might be 60-60, you've got these these pieces of equipment fighting each other all the time. You've got the AC coming on, it's getting cooler, but then the humidity is also rising because the humidifier's off, or the dehu's off, and then it switches places because then it's, you know, then the dehu kicks on, but then that makes the room hot. Um, so it's this constant cycle of on and off where you're also seeing these huge spikes up and down. Um, and so I kind of like to think of it like a balloon. Um, if you have a balloon filled with helium and you go outside and it's a, um, you know, a, a humid day versus a not humid day, the balloon will, will float and it will expand and contract. And um, that's how I think of the trichome head is expanding and contracting uh, because of this environment. And at some point, the expanding and contracting will cause cracks. And, you know, these small cracks, how much, how much terpenes, you know, how's the loss? Um, and so that's what I'm really interesting, interested in is taking a step further than just saying humidity and temperature and understanding the pressure that goes behind it. Uh, because all of that is, is wrapped around VPD and um, really understanding the internal pressure of what's in that cell and the, the outside room pressure and not causing those swings to be so intense. So stability is kind of more important than the temperature and humidity in the, in the grand scheme of things, because like Ed mentioned, going uh, and a lot of these folks that are drying in tents, they're having just that happen. For me, I have my humidifier kick on, fans are going around, sometimes I have an exhaust fan come out, I'm exchanging the air, but there's a lot of swings happening you know and it might be one or two degrees but those one to two degrees could be rupturing trichome heads right mm -hmm. exactly so overall what would be the ideal length of dry and number of days i've heard anywhere from seven to 14 days i hear five to ten days we know the downsides of drying too quickly versus trying too long and maybe you can get into to that to begin and then let us know what the ideal dry time day is in yeah, so I'd love to share with you, maybe you can squeeze into the talk, um, it's a graph we put out where it looks at days 1 to 14, um, it's looking at humidity and temperature and, and correlates the, the VPD, and it shows, you know, if you go out 14 days, um, it equates to this VPD, and so on, and so it shows kind of right in the middle there at 7 days, um, if you are at that 60-60 mark, you should be able to achieve it within seven days. Um, it's a really useful to, tool, um, but, you know, obviously you can you can go further than, let, let's say you're at 60-60 and you go eight days. Well, each day you go past, you're bringing more and more water out of that flower. And you may think, okay, well, I can just rehydrate it at some point. Um, but we're starting to see a, a lot of extreme rehydration can cause a lot of browning as well. Um, and so being able to pull it right at the right time and having to dry it a little more is okay. But if you're having to really, really have to rehydrate it, um, you won't have quite as great results. So the goal is to get it right where you want it, right when you pull it from uh, whatever drying environment you're in. Now, what about a four-day dry? So I have the Canatrol. I know you're familiar with the Canatrol. I've got one right back there, mm -hmm. and uh, I love it. I've been using it for over a year now. Uh, real consistent dries, hands off as far as I'm not really messing around with the equipment now, you know, humidifier and fan and all that stuff. But I think in their normal settings, 68 degrees Fahrenheit and a 54 dew point, which I believe is 61% RH, I think it's a four-day dry period, and then it transitions over to curing cycle. And that's their default settings. That's what they recommend. Is four days too quick of a dry? Um, you know, I don't. I don't think it's too quick. Um, you know, again, we're we're working through all of these nitty gritty details um, with Canotrol. Um, I I think anywhere between that four and ten day mark is is okay. Um, and again, but until we can say. You truly need five days at a water activity of 0.8 to convert the starches to sugars because that is what makes for the better smoke. It's, it's hard to, to 
say there's much difference in in three days as long as you're not drying it out too much which i know their product doesn't do um, i also know their product doesn't have the extreme swings um, that the traditional equipment does that's that's part of you know what their purpose is to have extremely um consistent uh, pressure um uh, you know vpd so no i don't i don't think it's too short and uh, you know i don't i don't think we'll be able to measure that until we kind of backtrack to what is what is a smooth smoke all right quantify that and then backtrack from there to say all right well five days would allow this process to fully develop to equate to the perfect smoke at the end um so you know sometimes i feel silly not having answers but as a researcher you're told you know, you're, you're told to be okay with not having answers because that's your job is to find the answers, not guess the answers. That makes total sense. Now, on the other side, you had mentioned four to 10 days. You know, a lot of folks are, are trying for longer than that, 14 plus days. Now, I heard from Dr. James Faust, one of the talks that he had, he said the same thing. Same window, I'm pretty sure, was four to 10 days. And he talks about some of the, da- the dangers of trying longer than that. Can you get into that? What happens? after 10 days when you're still drying yeah yeah so th- there's certain danger if if you're going out longer than 10 or 14 days and the reason that is is because any microbe that you had in your grow you're taking it with you into the drying room and the longer you have this bud sitting wet um, the more potential you have for botrytis growth and and peripheral proliferation all throughout the entire bud um for the most part in traditional drying sense when you're drying out a large bud it's the outside of that bud that's drying first and then the inside and so that's why when i say put the buds in a jar and, and wait a day or so until it levels out is because all of that moisture that's in the interior of the bud is then coming to the outside and it's it's equalizing um and so if if you're leaving the center of that bud at you know 0.88 water activity or even higher you know it, every minute is a, a second of botrytis or fusarium or whatever you might have um could could really take over and and cause problems got it yeah that's one thing that i don't even risk i usually go around seven days sometimes 10 days is the max but if it's going on long longer than that i'm concerned and i'm actually checking inside the buds and looking for visual although that could be there. It can be microscopic level. It's more than just the naked eye. You know, it could be there without us even seeing it. So scary. So you've done a lot of work with Canatrol. I know you've done a study with them. That's actually on their website, canatrols.com slash research, if I remember correctly. Real brief, where I think a lot of people are looking for more details in regards to that. So can you break us down what that study entailed? I believe it was the Canatrol versus the traditional 6060 method. There was, I think, 16% higher terpene content in Mm -hmm. the Canatrol drying. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so that that was first stab at, you know, really trying to understand um, their unit and the flower it creates and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, first stab as well, let's dry and cure at, you know, the two different methods, traditional and, and the Canatrol system. And let's test what happens and the problem they encountered and uh, problems we've seen other companies encounter when testing terpenes is that if you don't have your own internal lab there can be a lot of problems um and so you know you think about a a dried flower it's got two percent four percent whatever it may be uh um by dry weight of terpenes which is yeah that's a small number If we're looking at 100%, 2% is very small. Um, And so if we're mailing samples, even if you overnight it with ice, something's going to happen. And so any of effect that could happen during transit, or even if it's just being drove somewhere, anything within transit is going to affect the terpene levels. The other thing to think about is... You know, there's lots of great labs out there, but there's some that'll grab your samples and maybe treatment one sits on the counter for an hour, maybe treatment two doesn't. Um, and so if we're looking at getting true results on just 2%, um, 
that can cause a lot of problems, a lot of skewed errors. And so the way we overcame that is that uh, we work with a lab, Kacha, and I told them, you know, I want to do the extraction at my lab, and then I want to send you the liquid because the li the solvent, the solvent's not going to lose terpenes. It's going to be true to what exactly it was the second I pull it from whatever treatment is in. Um, and so that's what we send to the lab. Those are tested. Um, and so we can have very accurate results. And then, of course, have duplicates to uh, to make sure there is no off off problems. So that's how we did the terping testing. And that's the only thing that made me feel comfortable to do terping testing because it's so tricky. Um, but yeah, so getting results back from seven days traditionally drying and seven days in the canatrol. That's the results we got. Um, the other thing that you got to be super careful about and, and ask questions um, when you're looking at any study like this is, well, what was what was the water content? Because that can also skew the numbers. So, for example, if in the canatrol it's a perfect 0.61 water activity and in traditional drying, uh, let's say it went down to 0.58, you know, that might not seem like a lot, but in water weight, that will certainly, certainly skew the results. So we made sure we had all of those bases covered to where we're truly just looking at uh, the terpenes that the plant produced um, compared to one to the other. And so that's the results we got was 13% um, across the board terpenes. Um, each, each individual terpene, there was some you know, skewed, but overall that certainly was the result. Okay, now is there a like a white paper that folks can reference and and read more deeply into it? Is it was it peer reviewed or anything? We're going to duplicate it, um, and so we had we had reps within the study, but we want to duplicate it again before okay. the final white paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good to have a, a couple reps like that, just because you never know what could have went wrong along the way, and this is how you catch any problems that you may have. Exactly. Yeah, that's one thing I mentioned and. Uh, handful of videos now is science is repeatable. You need to be able to take that and repeat it over and over and over again in order to, for it to be fact. Exactly. One study isn't just fact, right? One study could say anything. It could be wrong. It could have, there could have been something that went wrong with it. And then it might, another study might come out and it, it's not repeated results. Right. So yeah, I think you're, you're doing your due diligence, doing things right in regards to making sure that it can be replicated and then, uh, and then going from there. So I'm looking forward to, to reading the final paper. Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was great results. I was I was impressed. I did make a video on this actually, and uh, some viewers were concerned. They mentioned that was a conflict of interest a little bit since Canatrol paid for the research. So, could you kind of explain how that works? So, CRC, you mentioned that you are the owner of the CRC. You did the research for Canatrol. Canatrol pays money towards the CRC for the research to happen. Uh, I understand how some people can consider that a conflict of interest, but like in this industry, how difficult it is to get funding and th the barriers you face in regards to this, like there's no government funding for you guys versus like other industries like food and beverage. There's so much more government funding and towards scientists and, and research and development, and all that stuff. Can you kind of break that? Oh, I know it's a little messy explanation there, but can you kind of break down how that all works? Yeah, yeah. So funding is hard. It's it's extremely hard. Um, you know, USDA likes to say that there are hemp grants out there, but they are not. Um, they are mainly for fiber and seed production. Um, and so if we're talking floral research, um, there is nothing there as far as the government goes. So our choices are donations from anyone right anyone can donate um and that's that's our 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 general donations is for our association and so so that's for research that is not coming requested by a company it's just something that you know the growers might say ah root aphids we want x amount of our funding this year to go towards you looking at root aphid control da da da, da. Um, but then, as I was saying earlier, another tier is um, third-party validation. And so Canatrol says, hey, I want to do this study. Um, 
we want you to perform it and give us results. And I say, that is great. I will perform the study. Um, but in respect to their company, I say, if, if you don't get the results you want, then I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. But if we get the results you want, you're, you know, I'll talk about the work we've done. Um, so there's no, there's no paying me for certain results. There's just respect of use of results. Um, and, you know, I would just want to make it clear when they pay for it, it's not like I'm going out and buying a new Volvo. It's Volvo. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> new car. I don't know how I'd buy a Volvo, but, um, you know, this, this pays for our research, the tests, testing's extremely expensive. Um, and it supports us in what we're doing, you know, even though it is a project for them, it, the way I see it, it's really a project for the industry to help to help to understand what's going on. I mean, if they were paying me to give results, I would have probably went a little higher than than thirteen percent or eighteen <laughs> percent. But um, yeah, so it, it's it's hard, um, and I understand people say, "Ah, oh, so and so is sponsoring this this test," but um, I mean, all you can do is trust me when I say we, you know, the the results we give is what science gave us and we're not falsifying anything you know just, just put it this way i've been back in south carolina six years now and for the first three years we have funded our own research um and i felt like i've not gotten anywhere because it's been slower than you know if you had some huge government grant but you know the stuff we sell on our consumer goods side that supports research um simply because i like doing it and i want to do it and i know there's you know, there's thousands of people out there that this will certainly help. Not to mention the patients who take advantage of the plant science that's discovered um, and how that trickles down all the way. But, you know, the CRC has been great for us. It brings in a little extra money um, and, and, and helps us get down to some of the problems we're having. Um, so can I say it's not funded by someone? No, it's funded by someone. Bunch of different growers different companies but i mean all of our money personally or not has to come from somewhere so um all i can do is show the viewers and readers of research you know throughout the over the years of of the research we're giving and and uh just keep giving good results and and helping farmers um that's what we're trying to do i appreciate you breaking that down yeah i think there are a lot of people out there who's just kind of ignorant of that fact of how the research is funded and you know where the money comes from i was ignorant uh, just a few months ago until i actually sat down and did the research and tried to figure out that hey the government isn't spending money towards this industry like they are in other industries so it's a lot harder for scientists to be able to conduct research and that's why it's so slow you know as far as doing the research and getting information out there it's just there's no money here coming from the government that's really funding it like there are in other industries so Right. Appreciate you breaking that down for us. Yeah, and there, there's no special research class that we can get in to, you know, have certain deductions or help with testing costs. I mean, cannabinoids and terpenes one test is hundred bucks, and carbohydrate tests is four hundred dollars per test. So it, it, it's limiting. Um, so we appreciate everyone that can can help us out. So we can't end the drying section until we talk about freeze drying. And a lot more and more people are talking about freeze drying. What is freeze drying and is it really the future? Uh, I, I've played with it a lot. I have. Um, in my opinion, I think for bubble hash, I think for any sort of concentrate extraction, that it's great and it's got a place. Now, I've seen some companies go out and buy millions of dollars of equipment and freeze dryers just for outdoor smokable flour. And I can tell you the ROI is not there. Um, so just to give you an idea, I have a freeze dryer and it's just one of the, you know, small two by three, maybe harvest rights. Um, and that is $3,500 with the pump and everything um and it'll hold what a pound and it takes 24 to 48 hours to run the one pound so you can imagine uh, just a two lighter 
you know, how, how long and how expensive that process is. So from a, a standpoint of ROI and making your money back, I can't see how that could be feasible. Um, from a flower standpoint, it keeps it the greenest I've ever seen. Um, but it's also very tricky to get the set points just right. Um, I've done it and I've seen a lot of people do it where you put it through the process and it's, you know, just, it's just dust. Um, but it, it, it keeps the plant exactly how it is when you harvest it. Let's just put it that way. So if we are finding that certain things like starch to sugar conversions, um, other uh, certain aspects like that are important for that smoke, you're certainly not going to get it with a freeze dryer. Um, because again, it, it pauses it in time. You know, any, any set starch that's there will be there at the, at the end of the freeze drying cycle. Wow. So it could actually be a bad thing. It could be. Wow. Interesting. Well, it's priced too high for me, so I'm not going to be doing it anytime soon. <laughs> I guess, yeah, for the average home grower, I mean, that, that price is, is crazy. Maybe in the future it'll come down. You know, there'll be competition, more people releasing freeze-drying machines. But uh, as of right now, yeah, I think it's kind of priced a little bit too high and too lengthy of a process for the average home grower. Agreed. So moving on to curing. What is curing and what happens during it? So in my eyes, curing is, is not just drying, curing, separated, you know, very discreet separate times of treatment to the flower uh it's really post-harvest handling so um it, it all kinds to go together with looking at the changes that are happening the the carbohydrate status um it's going from a very wet plant where changes are fast to a more dry plant where the changes are slowing down because the water's not there and available to let those enzymatic processes happen um and so in my mind it's it's a it's a one fell swoop um in order to prepare the flower for use um so you know people will say oh it's for um for, for sweating for um just very generalized answers making the flower better but you know again here i am in my stance of that's my guess of of carbohydrate change um but won't necessarily be able to answer that 100 percent confidence until next year i say next year uh 1 25 we get on this talk again and um, I'm hoping we have very different an or actually I'm hoping we have the same answers just with some data and details behind it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that burping, there is things that are happening, right? So burping, a lot of folks know about this basic method to where after it's dried, it's putting into a jar or turkey bag or grove bags, and they're actually removing the lid of the jar and off gassing has happened. And I know there's been studies, I think it was Dr. James Faust who was talking about the studies done the off-gassing, the CO2 levels, O2 levels, ethylene. Are you able to talk about any of that? Yeah, so ethylene is, you know, I don't think it's looked at enough. Um, and, I, and I understand why. It's very tricky to measure. Um, but if you look at cuttings, so poinsettia cuttings that are shipped from Guatemala to the U.S. for our Christmas poinsettias, if you're thinking about those pieces of plant, um, fruits and vegetables. There's so much money and so many businesses that exist just to control ethylene um, because it is, in short, a ripening agent. Um, we have been able to measure ethylene, and so we know that ethylene, uh, the amount that's produced is extreme in growing and drying, not as much as when the plant has dried out, so during curing, really. Um, so we, we know the levels are extremely high, but we don't know if that is a good thing or if it is a bad thing. Um, because maybe we do want the plant to ripen, which then is doing all of its conversions it needs to by having this push of ethylene. Or is it beneficial actually to get down to a certain drying point and then stop the ethylene production um, because you don't want it to go too far? 
But again, what are those metric points along the graph that we need to know here? Stop. Um, and so uh, Dr. Faust and I share a, an ethylene sensor, and it, uh, it's finicky. It's finicky. You need a little bit of humidity. You don't zero it out properly. It throws crazy numbers. So I feel like it's been a boot camp just learning how to use it properly. Um, so that is, is going to be a, a goal this year. Um, we're doing a study with a company that, that, uh, ha that makes post-harvest, let's just say I can't announce who yet, but curing containers. Um, and they're very excited about the thought of ethylene and what it could do or does. But again, it's just an exploration experiment. It's not, we're producing a product for them to implement. Um, and so, uh, to be honest, this goes back to our, our previous conversation is, you know, a lot of the sponsorship money is simply going towards exploration because we don't know what the starting points are yet to to alter that one way or the other. Um, so, you know, experiment one is putting flour in different types of containers and doing measurements. And that gives you your baseline where uh, after that you can say, all right, well, at day five, let's jack up the ethylene content and um, see what changes happened. So, yeah, ethylene, I believe, is um, the very important gas we need to take into account um, and, and start to figure out. And hopefully, again, this is the year to do it. Um, but O2 and CO2 is also very important. Um, you know, it's, I would encourage you if you have a sensor and as a home grower, especially because if you're using a mini split, um, you're recirculating that air. And so even though you're recirculating that air and you're adding your CO2 because your plants are taking the CO2 away, what does that mean about your ethylene? Are you also just compounding your ethylene content since you're not actually bringing in uh, fresh sourced air? I was talking with a grower uh, probably within the past year, and he has a, a dry room that went out of commission, so he had to use an old dry, an old growing room to dry in. Well, because it was a growing room, he had a CO2 sensor in there, and the numbers that the plants drying were producing, which he would never would have looked at the CO2 content if it had not been in, him drying in the grow room, which measures it. Um, and the numbers were like well past what's safe for a human to go in. Um, and so, you know, again, I don't know what that, what does that equate to exactly? I don't know. But when you have levels of anything out of whack so extreme, you need to understand and be able to apply, apply optimization behind it. And so it, it's just, it's wild being in an industry that we're still, on many things, extraction, you know, especially on the patient side, patients understanding all the different cannabinoids, everything as exploration right now. Um, so, yeah, it's exciting, but it's frustrating having to repeat you don't know so many times. <laughs> but none of us do, right? Yeah, still a lot to learn, still a lot to uncover, and I agree with you. Very exciting. That's one of the reasons why I like to be in this industry. You know, I said it in my videos many times in the past is, Doing the same thing over and over again, I mean, that gets boring to me. Being able to learn new things, cover new things, try new ways to grow, mm -hmm. it's exciting. It's fun for me, and so it makes the job more enjoyable. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing what gets uncovered there in the future. So with so many different ways to cure or store jars, turkey bags, grove bags, what have you found to be the best method? And then are there any of those methods that you would say aren't good to do and you should avoid? Um, you know, it, it always comes back to there's a there's a million ways to skin a cat. Um, and a lot of my work is is really working with the, the large scale growers who, you know, is looking at every penny spent. Um, you know, so, for example, sake, even though stainless steel is great and it's easily cleanable and it doesn't break like glass and it does a good job, you know, would it be possible for a commercial grower to go out and buy all stainless steel containers for thousands of pounds? No, probably not. So, you know, a lot of my time and work is spent 
looking at those limitations of, of really commercializing on a large scale and making the best call based from that. Um, now, if I'm at home and I'm growing my own and I'm putting it in my own, you know, resource that's available there for me and there's no limitations, I probably would use glass. I probably would use glass. Yeah, I would use glass. <laughs> so that, that's my short personal answer. Um, but that's not always the answer for large production. Got it. Yeah, I know. You hear through the grapevine of people being concerned about microplastics. You know, so the mm. turkey bags, grove bags, so on and so forth. But from what I'm understanding, there's no really research to back that up. That's just kind of a theory at this point. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see if anything gets uncovered there. You know, that that would be terrible microplastics were leaking in there and we were consuming them and There's always something to worry about yeah <laughs> <laughs> storage i want to ask you one more question in regards to storage so storage temperature a lot of people store in you know 60 degrees fahrenheit roughly say the higher the temperature the more terpenes are going to volatilize you're going to lose it right but the lower the temperature goes down i'm being told it's okay a lot of people are storing in a wine fridge that's about mm -hmm. 50 60 degrees fahrenheit that's one of my preferred ways to store some people in refrigerators, which is just above freezing, right? Uh, typically, but 33 to maybe 44 degrees Fahrenheit. Any concerns in storing in a wine fridge or a refrigerator? No, I, I think that's the best, the best move. Um, I would just be very certain that the container seals properly. You know, whatever container you're in is, is sealed. Um, cause even in a refrigerator, even though it would be slower, it still can dry out, um, if it's not made properly. So getting your drying down, your curing, and then holding, um, at the exact water activity you want in the lower temperature. Yeah. I mean, the, the lower you can go, the better. Um, uh, but I know some people, they don't necessarily have a, a full wine fridge just for their, their curing, which would be pretty cool. Do you have that? I do. Yeah, I was using the wine fridge before the Canatrol. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Yeah, because you know I live in Las Vegas and it's very hot here. And natural room temperature, it's I'm lucky to get seventy degrees Fahrenheit room temperature. Normally it's seventy five, sometimes eighty degrees. And I used to just store it in those conditions. And within three months, browning happening, like those higher temperatures really degrade the product. You know. Yeah. So uh, once I switched over to storing in the wine fridge, and yes, I have them in sealed jars. I also did in the Grove bags, made sure the humidity was locked in at 60 to 62%, but putting it in that lower temperature conserved them for a lot longer, you know, and I didn't have any browning. You know, I could have it for a year and there's no browning happening. So yeah, I was a big proponent of the wine fridge, not for drying. I want to be clear on that. Some people are trying drying in a wine fridge. Canatrol, now it's just for drying in. Curing. I think one of the biggest benefits of the, the control is the drying. A lot of people think, oh, well, I'll just buy a wine fridge. It's like, well, go ahead and try to dry in a wine fridge. It's, you, you know, you're not going to get a good result unless you do some sort of alteration to it. Anyways, yeah, I am a proponent of the wine fridge for storage in particular. And just wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit on storing at 60 degrees versus in a refrigerator at 40 degrees. If there's any, any big difference between those two. I think, like you said, it's just the length of shelf stability. Um, you, the colder you keep it, the slower any of those degradation processes are and uh, the longer it lasts. So, yeah, I think it all just matters of how picky you are with perfection and, and wanting to keep it as green and, and really longevity. If you know you're going to smoke it all in, <laughs> in a month, then maybe it's not necessarily re required to have your own fridge for for that and it'll do just fine in the in a you know a temperature controlled room um but yeah the the cooler i would say the longer is really the takeaway good to know a couple more questions for you one of them in regards to any studies that have been done recently in the past year or two that have uh, revealed some valuable information that you feel like would be valuable to the audience you know there's there's a couple studies out of UGA that have I don't know if they've been published yet, but it was a, a post-harvest study, um, and she was looking at terpenes and um, and hemp at different curings. But 
and again, going back to this, it's all exploration. Um, hers was very dirty with, you know, the barn hanging. The the 60-60 method was the, the best representation. And then she was looking at some of the technique, techniques you would do with uh, tobacco. So, you know, fire curing and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, there's been some studies and some nice generalizations we were able to conclude from them. But, you know, if you're looking for extremely high quality smokable flour at least i haven't seen it in the past couple of years um because again a lot of it has been on hemp with really the thought being outdoor hemp that you're drying fast for isolate production one exciting thing we've begun um and about to start phase one on which we could certainly use your help on getting the word out on this so um are you familiar with miyabi shields and um riley um yes yep. okay so they're they're both phds in uh basically pl plant chemistry they both have a little bit different specialty in each and so they now run the nonprofit in nap the network of applied pharmacognosy and so we've we've been friends for a while and been trying to find a way to work together and so we've now figured it out um we want to f we want to do a large pro project that's called this we're calling it the science of smokeability um, because basically everything from flushing to the joint being in your hands is what we're looking at um, and really trying to put understanding around what means or what represents a smooth smoke what is it about the color of ash that matters um there's been people say that certain smokes can make their tongue tingly and go numb which i've never experienced that so that one's going to be a little harder harder to dig into but um some of these generalities that everybody expects you know i want my ash white i want it to be smooth i want it cured for five months you know we we really want to look at again the the end point so consumer preference and back it up to be able to say what's doing what and so that's a lot to cover um, and so we're breaking it into phases with phase one it's going to be pretty easy pretty straightforward you have flour it, it's all ground to the same um, micron size it's all um, packed to the same density and it is all the same water content um, excuse me, it's not the same water content. You've got different water contents because we said, all right, well, that'll be the easiest is simply looking at water content. And so some with a, a 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 0 0.8. So you've got a high, you've got a low, and you've got what everybody says is just right. All right, very easy to get joints at three different contents like that. Send those out to the public, people that's interested in the in the study and have it double blinded and then the people say all right well this smell smells the best this tastes the best this smokes the best um you know we'll, we'll get super nitty-gritty into the uh the patient discovery which thankfully they've got experience on because i'm usually just with the plant but they're really good at connecting the plant and the treatments with the person and and how how to gather data from uh, from a person you know that's not something i have specialty in um so that's where we kind of all come together as a as a nice group ranging from you know growing all the way to to smoking so phase one water content we're going to have cbd joints and we'll be mailing them out and getting test results back and and see what's going on i mean the past two years i've dug so hard into tobacco research it's it's been ridiculous but um you know if you think about cigarettes if you're a smoker and you go to one state versus the other or if it's two years difference you're going to expect that cigarette to be exactly the same and you're going to be mad if it's not um and so there's science and there's repetition and there's there's a lot that's going in to get that cigarette exact um and that's what we can do in cannabis you know we know we know when good ones are good um, and there's growers that can produce good ones consistently but can you how do you 
convert that to be able to show other growers this is what's good. Um, until you have data behind that, you, you can't. So that is our goal is first start with water content and then we'll go on to other things like uh, certain elements that can accumulate that causes a bad smoke. There's certain elements that can accumulate that um, that will cause the ash to break off faster than others. Um, so phase two will be um, elements because in tobacco, they go deep into, you know, even the, the government restricting certain applications of certain fertilizers in excess because it will mess with the smoking process. Super interesting. I follow both of them on social media and they're always coming out with interesting information. Speaking of social media, let's, uh, let's wrap things up. Can you tell the listeners how they can find you and what you have upcoming in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So Instagram, of course, we've got um, dr.justice uh, underscore grows, and that's my Instagram. And then, of course, the CRC is just uh, Cannabis Research Alliance. Look us up there. We've got websites, um, easily Googleable. I won't spell out all the long names. The hint mine is our CBD brand. And yeah, follow us on basically all social media platforms. Awesome. And I'll definitely have a link to her Instagram down in the YouTube description section below so you can easily navigate to that and find her. If I missed any questions that you think that relate to harvesting, drying, or curing, drop them down in the comment section below. Love reading through the questions. And maybe if there's enough questions, we can get her back on and see if we can get some of these questions answered. So, Dr. Allison, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. This has been, uh, this has been a great talk. And I think uh, my audience is going to get a lot of value from it. So, thank you for your time today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.